Good evening, everyone. My name is Steven Snyder. I'll be presenting this evening. A little bit of background about myself, since I'm sure a lot of you don't know me. I started meditating in 1976, started in the Zen tradition for about a little over 20 years, did a number of retreats, uh, went through some ordinations, and gravitated uh, to practice in the Tibetan Buddhist lineage as well, and landed in the Theravadan lineage. I studied with a teacher, Pa Ok Saidao, from Myanmar, did a two-month retreat with him uh, probably about 15 years ago, uh, did well on the retreat, and he asked another student and I to write a book about our experiences, which we did called Practicing the Jhanas. Uh, we did the jhana practice with him, and were among the first Americans to do so. So that was the basis for the book. And about a year after the book, or I guess a year before the book came out, he authorized me to teach. So I'll be teaching tonight from my newest book, which is called Buddha's Heart. It's a, a new presentation of the ancient Buddhist heart meditations uh, mixed in with some psychological workings that relate to the, the uh, heart meditations we call the Brahma Viharas. Tonight we'll be focusing on a quality of our deeper nature, our true nature called innate goodness. And the reason that this practice is a really both foundational and a, I guess, a regular practice to maintain to me is that innate goodness being a quality of our true nature means that it's not conditioned. That means we don't have to do anything to get it. We don't have to behave or perform a certain way. It's independent of all that. It's an unconditioned heart radiance that actually has its source in the source of the universe, which is universal love. And the universal love manifests into all these different qualities. And one of the qualities that it manifests in us is our innate goodness. So it becomes a really useful practice to learn and, and, and to do. I, I use it uh, daily, probably the first 10 or 15 minutes of any meditation I do, I do innate goodness meditation. So um, I'm going to start off with a little presentation, and then we'll get into the meditation. There'll be plenty of time for questions and comments. Uh, I know you're used to using the chat function. I'm not too adept at the chat function. But if you have a, a general question, put it there. I'll try to include that in what I'm talking about. And then I think when I have questions, I'll probably just ask you to unmute and then call on people as I see them unmute. And uh, manage questions or comments that way. One caveat is I ask that in your any sharing you do that you not comment on anybody else's sharing. I think to keep that uh, nice and clean and uh, keep a good quality of right speech is useful. So usually in our life, when we receive mirroring, we're receiving mirroring based upon what we do. Uh, we do something that a parent, a caregiver, an employer, a teacher likes, they give us praise. And so we learn that when we do stuff, uh, we're, we're valued. And the problem with that is that they're only expressing the mirroring or showing the mirroring when we do things. So we equate our value only with doing. We don't actually have much of a sense that we have a value uh, in terms of our beingness, just our, our being here right now. We don't feel like there's necessarily a quality or a, a value to that. And so this counteracts that. That's one of the benefits of innate goodness practice. So we get to be ourselves in the innate goodness. Um, and my guess is if you reflect on your early life in particular, and you think about somebody who you felt really valued you and cherished you, you're probably going to find somebody who was valuing you for your beingness, for just who you were, rather than anything you did. 
because those seem to be the memories that we hold that are really important memories and what we can relate to innate goodness. As I mentioned, innate goodness is unconditioned. Anything that's conditioned is born and has to die. It has a lifespan. What's unconditioned isn't. It's ever present. It's always here. It's not born. It doesn't die because it's the source of the universe. It's the viscosity. It's the life-giving force that animates all of life. The felt sense of the innate goodness typically is a radiance in the heart. People talk about it as a warmth, as something subtle, fresh, flowing, uh, just an overall okayness seems to be part of the experience. So as I mentioned, there are benefits to doing the innate goodness meditation. The first benefit is we're simply being with our unconditioned goodness. And that gives us a natural buoyancy and resilience of spirit because we're actually connecting with a part of ourselves that isn't a conditioned part. We feel more valued, more seen. We just feel more valuable to ourselves in our beingness. The innate goodness also counteracts a lot of the negative self-talk that so many people engage in and also can help to soften the negative self-judgments that we can impose upon ourselves regularly. And also being with innate goodness puts us in contact with the quality of our deeper nature or true nature. So that in itself is a benefit. So real briefly, uh, I'm gonna talk about the, the inner critic it relates to this practice. Uh, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist. I've done uh, exploration and reading in this as it relates to my own practice and teaching. So that's how I'm presenting this. And fundamentally, the inner critic or superego is formed when we're young, they think between ages two and five. And essentially we, we uh, take in a caregiver, a parent, an older sibling, someone who's telling us what not to do, uh, don't run with scissors, don't play in the street. All these things are excellent advice when we're two or three years old and we don't know um, what to do. We can, we can take it in. So that helps quite a lot um, in terms of our staying alive and all that. The problem is as we get to be adults, we still have the superego coming in with these negative thoughts. You did that wrong. I can't believe how dumb you are. Things like this. And the effect of those is we feel smaller. We really contract in our interiority. We really feel crowded. We feel like we're uh, really not, don't have much value. So it can lead to feelings of helplessness, hopelessness, worthlessness, all that. And so we're really trying to um, get in contact um, with value that, that isn't, again, isn't connected to behavior. But the superego, because it's so negative, it causes that contraction. And really to be, uh, to have the territory for insight, for awakening, for realization, we need to have an inner spaciousness. So we need to do practices like this that push back on the superego, create some space for us, and let us practice. Some of the resistances to innate goodness, the self talk I mentioned before. Uh, the self-talk really has a function of reinforcing, reifying who we take ourselves to be, who we take ourselves to be as a personality. I like that car. I don't like those shoes. I like this TV show. I don't like that magazine. And by asserting the likes and dislikes, it's a kind of sonar that keeps us clear about who we are. So that's a resistance just being with what's unconditioned and innate. The self-judgments are also a resistance to innate goodness. We'll start doubting and questioning uh, with the negative self-judgment. And again, that makes us feel small and contracted, which we really want to develop practices that let us feel expanded and in an expansive spaciousness within. And one of the biggest resistances to innate goodness is compulsive doing. And this is really the... The, the, the activities that we engage in to avoid feeling the pain of not being seen, 
of not being valued. And we believe that doing is the only way that we're gonna be seen, we're gonna be appreciated, and really we're gonna survive. We're gonna keep our job, keep our relationships, all of that. So it really is, is something that's really quite pressing on us. So I wanna just check in and see, um, how are you all doing with that? Um, I did wanna share one thing. Uh, I have two students who are, have been introducing innate goodness to um, people in prison. And it's people who are, the folks they're working with are people who have done violent crimes by and large. And they're finding that virtually all of them are able to make contact with their innate goodness. The exceptions they're finding are people who are the uh, sociopaths um, because there just isn't enough uh, internal structuring they don't have a, a way to land on that. And so my advice to them was just ask them how to best approach this. So uh, that's kind of sort of a stay tuned, but I'm really happy to see that getting applied in that setting. So having said all this, I'd like to go ahead and have us turn and uh, do the innate goodness meditation. And I wanna say a little bit about it as we, as we will get started. Innate goodness is a concentration meditation. So concentration meditation means we, we focus on one object to the exclusion of everything else. That means our thoughts, our bodily sensations, our environmental distractions, but we don't suppress those. We're not trying to get rid of them. We're not trying to stuff them in the, in the attic. We're, we're trying to simply prioritize the meditative object over everything else. So that means anything that's going on, if you're, you have a thought about what's for breakfast tomorrow, just let it go, let it be there, that's not a problem. Just stay with the practice, stay with the innate goodness. And this is also a practice of radiance, meaning we even in the practice, we don't have to do anything. We really are, getting in contact with our beingness, with our unconditioned heart radiance. So that's what we're making, making contact with in the meditation. And it feels to most people like a radiance of flowing. I mentioned warmth, okayness, a kind of subtlety. So it's not, it's not overly dramatic. There's something that's sort of subtle, a little soft about it, fresh even. And um, in doing this meditation, the way it's done is that you want to have a picture in your mind's eye of, of yourself. And uh, some people find it difficult to do themselves. If that's you, then pick someone who you have an easy time making contact with their innate goodness, such as a, a, one of your children, a relative, a pet, anything, anyone like that is perfectly fine to use. And you want to pick a time when you can see their innate goodness. And I sometimes suggest people look for pictures in their memory of when they were exhibiting childlike joy, that kind of effusive joy that may be not connected to any cause. There's just a exhilaration. If you're someone who's not a visual meditator and some people are not, then you wanna make contact with the felt sense of innate goodness. So you wanna you want to think about a time in your life, a memory in your life when you were really in touch with that innate goodness, again, childlike joy, and just what did that feel like? What was it like to make contact? What was the energy like as you remember that important memory? And so that's how you make in contact with the innate goodness, either through the picture visually, or through the felt sense, which is more of an energetic kind of heart quality connection. And our eyes are closed. We're gonna rest our, aware our awareness in uh, our heart area. And we're gonna be with the picture or the energy of the memory of felt sense, uh, excuse me, felt sense of innate goodness. And if you have about 10 or 15 minutes where you're resting, where you're feeling the innate goodness, this is a good time to see about, see if you can rest your awareness directly in the innate goodness. 
So rather than holding the picture or the felt sense, just see if the awareness can rest right in the goodness. So give that a try. And I will do a few reminders just to uh, make sure everybody is back with the innate goodness. I'm going to start real briefly with some posture instructions. Uh, I know you all have been meditating for a while, but I just find it helpful to go over some basic posture instructions, just as a reminder on how to best position your body so you're comfortable and have the uh, optimal meditation. We're going to meditate for about 30 minutes. So start with your feet being flat on the floor. If you're in a cushion, your legs and feet will be in contact with the floor. Feel the deep support that the building you're in has for you right now. And feel the earth beneath that supporting each and every one of us. We want to have our knees ordinarily lower than our hips. That allows us to have a natural pelvic tilt. While we want to be upright, we're not looking for a ramrod straight posture. We want to allow for the natural S curve in our spine. You may want to rock a little to the left and right. Make sure your weight's evenly distributed. Some of us, through a variety of reasons, have a little tilt when we meditate. So you might want to see if you can center that. And really relax your shoulders. Really let them come down. I like to imagine my shoulder blades are melting down my back towards the ground. And that gives us a nice open chest for a natural breath. We don't want to force a large breath or short breath. We want to just let the, breath, the breathing be very natural. We also want the neck to be loose. That's a place of tension. So you may want to make some small circles with your head and just feel that your head is balanced and level on your neck. Your face should be on a flat plane perpendicular to the floor with your chin tucked down ever so slightly. We don't have our chin up. That promotes thoughts and daydreaming. If it's too far down, that promotes drowsiness, sleeping and daydreaming. But just a little bit down, quiets down the thoughts just a little bit. Want to relax your jaw. That's a place we hold a lot of tension. And notice where your jaw connects to your skull, that, that socket there. Just see if you can move your jaw a little and feel a little bit of space there, a little relaxation. If you wish, you can put your tongue against the top, the upper palate behind your front teeth. If that's not comfortable for you, don't worry about it. You want your face to be very relaxed. Just let those muscles relax. Let your eyes be soft in their sockets. This is an eyes closed meditation. Your eyes don't need to be involved or play a part. So let them rest. And as I mentioned, let yourself just breathe naturally. There's no particular way to breathe. And again, if you're a visual meditator, picture yourself at an age when you can make contact with that innate goodness, that exuberant joy. If you're not a visual meditator, what was the felt sense like of that memory? How did it feel? What was the energy of it? That's what you want to make contact with. And just stay with these memories, with these pictures as the felt sense begins to develop. If you find you're staying really solid with the picture or felt sense of innate goodness, and the innate goodness is very present for you, see what it's like to rest your awareness directly in innate goodness, your innate goodness.
Notice if your awareness has wandered from being with the picture or felt sense of your innate goodness. If it has, return it with kindness.
If your awareness has wandered, gently return it without criticism, self-judgment.
in these last few minutes before I ring the bell. See if you can stay close to your innate goodness.